and in addition, in addition to uh, to the commissioner, uh, we'll have uh, joining us virtually is uh, Gilles Morel, who's the EMEA president and executive vice president of Whirlpool Corporation. And we also have Delara Burkhardt, who's a member of the European Parliament with the Socialists and Democrats from Germany. And joining me on stage is Chloe Mikolajczyk, who is a campaigner with a Right to Repair Europe. Um, just a reminder, uh, if you do have questions, do use your swap card. I'll be keeping an eye on them. And there is the, uh, the poll, and I will, uh, I will, raise, I will um, uh, answer the or announce the poll results at the end of the panel. The question is, what would help Europe turn its economy circular by 2050? And if, you if there's enough answers to be statistically viable, then we'll, uh, we'll announce that at the, uh, at the end. Um, we heard a little bit from the, uh, from the commissioner uh, giving an outline of, uh, of what the commission is, uh, is planning. Uh, Chloe, can you give me uh, a sense of how you react to what you've just, uh, is, uh, just uh, heard? Is it, uh, is it enough? Do you want more? We always want more. We always okay. think it's not that's enough. A, that's the uh, traditional view of NGOs on just about every, uh, every well, aspect. I mean, that, you know, uh, we happens. are in a climate emergency and we are in a social emergency, so okay. we need radical and ambitious measures. And if you look at the first quote of the letter that we sent to the European Commission this morning, it's pretty clear. 210 million smartphones are sold annually in the EU. That's almost seven every second. So I think that's a pretty striking number. And despite 77% of EU citizens preferring to repair their goods rather than buy new ones, only around 11% will repair their phones when they break. So, you know, the numbers are out there. We have a massive quantity of e-waste that we discard every year in Europe. Um, and at the same time, we need a lot of the minerals that can be found today in our smartphones and our laptop to power the transition, the energy transition. So do we really still need to extract that many minerals in order to use them in products that could actually have a longer lifespan if they could be repaired? And um, the commissioner mentioned the, the Circular Electronics Initiative, and it's true that it, it has been postponed, um, so we're still waiting to kind of see what's going to be inside. But the out of the, the different um, regulatory processes that are ongoing at the EU level when it comes to repairability and electronics more specifically, there are several shortcomings and they're quite important. You know, they're, It's limited in the scope, I think that's the first one. Um, we now have an eco-design regulation for uh, household appliances, some of them. Currently in the pipeline is an eco-design regulation for smartphones um, and laptops. Computers, it's been delayed. Then for another one, um, which is not an eco-design regulation, it's about printers. And here we see voluntary agreements so with the industry that have a lot of loopholes. And at the same time, in these different regulations, there are for us, two critical, two critical points that are not being addressed. And the first one is the issue of cost. Repair is still too expensive for a lot of people, and we know that if it's too expensive, people prefer to replace. Um, and then, then there's also the issue of software, which is currently not really being addressed. So all these shortcomings mean that repair is still not the default option because of the political system and the economic system, and that needs to shift. People need to be able to repair their stuff if they want to. So Virginia did raise the issue why 10 years for the smartphones? What, what prompted you guys to, to, hit, to aim for that, that particular well, target? And is that at all realistic? I mean, 10 years ago, did we even have iPhones? I don't think that they were even, I can't remember that far back, but I, they, were, they, they were obviously, the technology was vastly different than what we have today. How realistic is it to set that kind of a target? Well, I think when you look at the average lifespan of products today, uh, or smartphones specifically, it's between 1.8 and 2.5 years. So it's nowhere near enough. And when you look at studies and what would be needed in terms of how many years we would need to keep our stuff uh, in order to compensate for their impact, and most of the impact of a smartphone phone up to 80% occurs during the manufacturing stage. We're talking about potentially decades. So 10 years, if you look at it that way, is not that much. And we didn't say that every phone needs to last 10 years and then stop. Um, we said that we wanted phones to last potentially at least 10 years. And I think that makes a big difference. And when we talk to people, um, to consumers notably, 
they want products that last longer. Right to repair is one of the most supported piece of regulation across Europe. All the studies show it, whether, wherever you are on the political spectrum, whether you're on the left, you're on the right, whatever the demographics, people are frustrated with the stuff that don't last as long as they want to. And from an environmental perspective, it makes a lot of sense as well. So we did aim for 10 years, uh, and that is specifically for smartphone, but when you look at other products, it should be even more. Thanks very much. Gilles, you're on the uh, industry side of things, obviously slightly different, different sector. Um, what was your reaction to what you heard from, uh, from the commissioner today? And um, what are you hoping for out of the, uh, out of the, whole, uh, the whole package? So, um, as also Chloe mentioned, um, the household appliances have been covered by the eco-design. And we have taken a, a proactive approach, a collaborative approach. Uh, now, um, uh, on the eco-design, and now the household appliances uh, that are created are, are designed uh, with this eco-mindset. Uh, as uh, also Ilan Kadri uh, mentioned earlier, uh, it's a design mindset uh, in terms of uh, recyclability, reparability, uh, and, and so on. So we welcome the expansion of, uh, of the, uh, through the, the Sustainable Product Initiative beyond eco-design. Honestly, for our, for our industry, this has worked well, so uh, why not for the other industries? As we speak, we are implementing a, a new energy label uh, uh, for, for some of our uh, categories of appliances, and that's going to be uh, extended in the years to come. Uh, that has uh, proven a benefit for, for, for the planet and, and for the people who have uh, household appliances because they consume less electricity, less water. So that that's... Uh, uh, that now we expand uh, to uh, uh, repairability, durability. These are things that are close to, to uh, what uh, a company like Whirlpool has, uh, has started with, with 110 years ago. We, with, uh, we started our history uh, by, be, by creating a repairable, by making our electrified washing machine a repairable. So if we can expand it uh, further, absolutely. Uh, we are so now we can, uh, as as the commissioner said, uh, what is uh, you know each uh, category uh, as a, as a, a, a lifetime. Uh, our washing machine uh, are designed to last uh, long. That's where we take our pride. Uh, however, it's not forever. And uh, but during the period of time, and uh, you know our spare parts are, are guaranteed for ten years. We have to ensure that uh, consumers have access to to repairability. And uh, happy to comment uh, uh, on this. The only uh, uh, comments I have uh, on, on on what I've heard so far is that um, uh, the difference is to be made now. Uh, if we want to eat the the fifty five percent by twenty thirty, if I take the example of appliances. It's, it's going to happen now. It is going to happen with appliances that have been sold two years ago, that will be sold this year, next year, and the year after. Because this one will stay in, a, in, a, in, in the homes of the people across Europe during this period. So that's why it's important uh, to, uh, to make sure that uh, uh, European homes are equipped with sustainable appliances as well. Otherwise, that would be very difficult to, to hit uh, the, the, the objective that the EU uh, uh, fixed. So that, that's uh, the limit. Uh, you, know, uh, you don't want to keep a refrigerator uh, 30 years ago. Objectively, a refrigerator that was produced in 1990 was consuming more than 1,000 kilowatts per hour. Uh, per, per year. Uh, now we have a refrigerator under 200. So we need to find the, the right balance. For what products are designed to, to last, they need to be repaired. And that's the scope we have. And uh, at the end of life, this will need to be a circular uh, uh, economy answer. And that's the, the, what we're going to support the commission with a sustainable product initiative. But we need now to accelerate and get rid of appliances uh, and, and which are, by the way, recycled, the component I recycle, that are not good for the planet. Uh, so there's an obvious business, now, there's an obvious business case. You not get there. There's an obvious business case uh, for companies like yours. If you're becoming more energy efficient, you've got new products that, uh, as you said, that are much, much better than the stuff that was out, was out 20 or 30 years ago. But going forward, um, doesn't this, in a sense, undermine uh, a key part of the innovation cycle for businesses like yours or smartphone makers or computer makers that you want 
the, the bigger memory, the faster, the, the cooler display, the, 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 the neater function. So you, the whole idea is that you're dissatisfied with what you've got, whether it's in your pocket or in your kitchen, and you want to get the new, jazzier, fancier thing, and, and that, that keeps every, the, the mills of industry spinning. So if you, if you knock that out, what does that do for your business over the long term? If people, if I buy a fridge for my lifetime, that's great for the environment, not so good for you, right? Well, I, I don't mean a lifetime. Let's be realistic. Huh? Uh, and uh, uh, we, our appliances are designed to last 8, 10, 12, maximum of 15 years. What is important is that those appliances are, are over time uh, produced with components steel, plastic, cement, electronics that are sustainable. And at the end of life, there is a, another life for, for them uh, back in the circular economy. Uh, innovation, uh, sustainability has been a, a strong engine of innovation for industry uh, in terms of uh, think about the dryers moving for air vented to, to heat pump. So I do believe uh, sustainability is a driver of innovation. Huh? That's uh, uh, There will be no future for, for, for appliances, for industry, if they are not sustainable. So uh, I, I do believe the, the, the key, it's, it's important that appliances can be repaired, but the key is not they last forever. The key is that we have a circular economy, and that's all the objective under the Sustainable Product Initiative. Can, can Thanks. I, oh, please go ahead. That? Yeah, just, I fully agree with what Gilles said about sustainability being a key driver for innovation. And then I think we need to ask ourselves what type of innovation do we want? Do we want a type of innovation that keeps making stuff that we don't need and makes us believe that we need them and buy them? I mean, that's not the kind of world I want, and I think I'm almost the youngest person in the room, and that's not the kind of uh, world I want to live in. I want to live in a world where innovation actually, you know, drives a, a fairer, greener, more equitable world, and then to react on um, how long we should keep products. And of course, a fridge from 1990 is not as energy efficient as a fridge that was produced five years ago. But I think there's two key aspects here is that the eco-design regulation from 2019, which came into force on the 1st of March of this year, only applies to new products put on the market. So a, phone, um, a fridge or a washing machine that was produced two or three years ago, as, as Jill was mentioning, that will still be in European homes for the next 10, 12, 15 years, might not be um, you know, as eco-friendly as the new washing machines that have been put on the market after the 1st of March. And then a final thing um, about the repair versus replacement argument is that you know, there were some several reports, including from NGOs, but including from the GRC, so you know, the, the European institutions themselves, that showed that in order to compensate that uh, environmental footprint that is produced during manufacturing, some appliances, and this is the example of washing machines, should not be replaced if they are less than 17 years old, and in some cases, 23 years old. And that is applicable to washing machine. For smartphone and for small electronics, it's even longer. We should keep our products for such a long time if we're serious about compensating um, its, its environmental footprints. That mainly occurs during the manufacturing stage. The original footprint made to use to actually to produce, produce the, the stuff. phone. For, for phone, up to 80% of its environmental footprint occurs during the manufacturing stage. So I'm not saying that in some cases it's not true and we should always repair or replace. It is true for certain products, depending on when they were uh, manufactured, of course. But it's not true for all products. And it's also, uh, you know, energy efficiency isn't the only criteria that we should be looking at. Then there's the impact on water, there's the impact on biodiversity, there's the climate impact. So there's so many stuff that should be taken into account. Great, thanks. Delara, I'd like to bring you in uh, as well. What's, uh, what's happening in Parliament on, uh, on these initiatives? Can you bring us up to speed with that? Sure, I can. Um, so thanks, uh, first of all, for the first interesting round. Um, and of course, in, in the Parliament, we are really impatiently waiting for the Sustainable Product Initiative and all other legislative proposals that are announced now for 2020. 23. Of course, we would also have liked to see more sooner action, uh, but still um, we, we are looking forward um, for a comprehensive approach. Well, this is basically what I will also measure as a member of the Environmental Committee, um, a successful um, ICT, but also other, um, other initiatives, whether they are, the approaches the Commission will take um, are current and also ambitious enough because I am convinced, and Chloe also made that clear already, we, ha we have no time to waste if we want to hit our climate targets. And I really have to think a, a lot about this. 
um, especially in the last week and also this week, um, where we saw, I think, a, a perfect proof why we need to rethink. Um, because I, I bet that everyone in this room uh, in front of their laptops has for sure received advertisements for Black Friday, Black Week, Cyber Monday, you name it, um, on every corner over the few last days. And I think if we continue to support this kind of marketing strategy, how are we able to really implement the goals of the Green Deal in, in terms of resource efficiency, in, 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 in terms of circularity, um, so what I'm, um, and I, I, I have the whole pyramid behind me for that, uh, what we are fighting for is not a black deal, but really a green deal. Um, and it also has been said that we, we have produced more items of internet related electronics than there are actually humans in the world. We know that e-waste is, is one of the fastest growing waste streams worldwide and only 15 to 20% is recycled. This is not sustainable. So um, as European Parliament, we get, gave the European Commission a clear mandate to get started with ambitious goals to really tackle its whole way products. And this is what I think we have to have in mind. It's really, it's a mind shift on how we are producing. And we as Europeans need to ensure that products in the EU market are, are designed to last longer, that are easier to reuse, easier to repair, easier to recycle. And I think we have a really important role model function in that and, and show that this is a, a strategy that could work. But we, we have to have a um, current approach and this is what we're pushing for in the parliament. Great, thanks. Uh, I'm actually Canadian and uh, the uh, Quebec banned uh, Black Friday uh, or even Vendredi Fou, but that was not for environmental reasons, it was for cultural linguistic reasons, that it was a, an American cultural import which did not jibe with Quebec culture, so they, they decided to, to ban that. So it might be something that Quebec could, uh, could sort of spread to, to Europe. Um, to go back to, uh, to Parliament, are there sort of key metrics that you're, uh, that you're pushing for uh, that, that the Commission will include, whether it comes to the range of, of goods that are, that are covered by the initiative, the uh, uh, the kind of timelines. What, what are what are the what are the the, the things? That, what's the message that you're sending to to the uh, to the commission? I mean, um, what what we are really pushing for is not to have like a prioritization. I think prioritization, especially when we talk about the ICT sector, is, is very very difficult. And I think um, what we need to look is really the the whole sector because we know that. The impact, the environmental impact really comes from all product and we know that um, the, the consequences arise collectively all over the sectors. So um, what we also, and I think this is something of a, of a crucial demand of the parliament um, connecting to all the eco-design efficiency standards we, we, we have to have in mind, is that we really also call for a ambitious legislation, especially when it comes to the right to repair, uh, where I think it's important that we need mandatory standards for repairability and durability of products. So uh, not fo focusing on a prioritization in terms of um, sectors and products that uh, need to be um, put forward, but also having this um, right to repair as also a symbol uh, for a more sustainable product um, policy in, in Europe. And I think there we have a very, very great potential for for research, uh, resource efficiency, um, for climate protection, uh, but also for, and I think this is a very important point, as we also frame the Green Deal as a positive change maker on the ground, uh, we know that there, there are a lot of studies um, saying that there really is also a chance for local economic development and, and creation of jobs when we talk about uh, repair. Um, so um, there, um, uh, there, according to some studies, um, we, we have up to 200 jobs that could be created for every thousand tons of e-waste in the repair sector. And this only if 20% of Europe's e-waste was re recycled. So um, this um, this is really a, a big chance we also see. So this is what we uh, what we in the parliament tried to also underline, that there are chances coming with this transition that have a positive impact for everyone in Europe. And I, I think this is something um, where we would also like the, um, the commission to, to act on. And, and especially when it comes to right to repair, I, I have to say that I'm really proud that also the new German government has now um, supported um, the, the right to repair um, as well as the extended producer responsibility. And I think this is this systematic shift we need, um, not only looking at the, the scopes of, um, of the regulations, but also having um, 
uh, a big symbolic um, but very effective state, uh, question like the right to be repair being put forward. So uh, if you ask me about the timeline, do it quick, but also make, make it current. Thanks very much. Um, just about everybody has talked about the right to repair. And Virginia, so I'd like to ask you, um, in the upcoming initiative, um, where will right to repair figure? And do you, are you sort of leaning more towards uh, right to uh, a repair being uh, done through professional service centers? Or is it supposed to be wider, broader, that uh, more normal people, handy people, can take apart their components, fix them themselves, and have access to spare parts at a reasonable cost? I mean, is that, is that going to be included in, the, in these? Uh Yes, uh, thank you for your for your question and, and, and thank you everyone for their uh, interesting thoughts. Uh, so repair is is definitely at at the core. It's a very important uh, component of, of of circular economy action plan and repair should be a preferred option, which, which means of course first of all it should be affordable and facilitated by the design of products. And this will extends uh, extend the, the the useful life of goods. Uh, and the Commission already works uh, to, to, to foster repair under the, the current regulatory framework when revising eco-design measures or proposing new uh, ones. Repair, repair, repairability provisions, uh, they are explored for each product group. Uh, and as mentioned before, for instance, uh, the Commission introduced repairability requirements for washing machines, uh, dishwashers, fridges, uh, displays, uh, including TVs. So. Re re uh, repairability is also considered in the current preparation of the measures on smartphones and, and tablets, but the efforts on, on repair, they do not stop here. In addition to product requirements, we will strengthen the rights of, of, of consumers to repair products at fair prices, because that's the key. And this will be done through a new legislative initiative on the right to repair plan uh, for 2022. And uh, we're going to soon launch um, an open, uh, open public co consultation. Now, for your second part of the question, the promotion of independent repair is a key element uh, to ensure that uh, consumers, they have access to repair services that are affordable. Also, when the legal uh, guarantee of a product has expired. So this is an important aim of, of eco-design measures that set uh, repairability requirements. For products such as uh, washing machines and, and, and dishwashers, spare parts, and, and relevant repair information has to be made available to professional repairees and end users as, as appropriate for a minimum uh, for a minimum duration. And uh, the parts uh, must also be designed to be to be easily replaced with the use of commonly available tools and without damage to the appliance. For some parts, availability is aimed specifically at the professional repairs uh, in view of possible risks regarding intellectual, of course, property, liability issues. Uh, and therefore, in some cases, independent repairs may have to declare that they have the appropriate skills and, and liability insurance uh, for repair. So in preparing, and, and uh, I want to return a little bit to what was said uh, at the beginning uh, as regards the um software and uh, and our phones getting slower in 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 just a year or or a couple of years time so in preparing eco design measures for smartphones and tablets uh, of course relevant barriers to repair of devices uh, are carefully assessed and and they taken into account eco design requirements could also include software uh, related elements since uh, software is a part of product design, and I'm I'm sure that this aspect is being examined as as well uh, in the preparation of eco design uh, measures uh, for, for for smartphones and 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 work on the impact assessment uh, on the initiative is ongoing. And uh, as I said, we we can expect uh, uh, the end of it, the, the the final result in 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 2022. So, do you think that, or is the goal that you will actually set? Price parameters, or, or to make sure that these that these repairs are are affordable, is that is that going to be part of the uh, the package? Yes. Yeah, so uh, first of all, availability of 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 uh, of um, additional of spare parts, uh, and what we want to do is that um, 
uh, producers, they would uh, give the full information to consumers, uh, most likely through the digital passport of sort of which parts uh, they can actually replace uh, in how long they should last uh, before they're su 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 supposed to be replaced and so on. So the consumer would have a choice between does he want a, 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 a phone, let's say, which has easily replaceable parts, easily accessible. Of course, the price would also be, be, be known in advance and consumer could make a choice. Uh, you know, all this can be effective and working only uh, based on consumer choices. This is how the uh, uh, eco-design directive with energy efficiency actually reached those, those great results because it was uh, information which was uh, easy to understand, easy to access for consumers, and they made their choices uh, on uh, as regards the fridge or washing machine or, or, or light bulb uh, to, to which extent, which one they want to buy and, 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 and how energy efficient they has to be. So could you talk us through how that would actually work? I've got a fridge, you know, five years from now, I need to replace something, uh, do I, write to Whirlpool and within three days you send me the part, I pull out the old one and plug it in myself, or how, how is it actually going to work? So again, for every product, uh, and, and, and it will depend, or it wasn't a question for me, it was a question for Whirlpool. More for the guy no, making the washing machines in the fridges. So. I'm sorry, because I saw him starting to speak okay. and, and I dropped it off, so yeah, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so, for for uh, if you learn, it's not how it will happen uh, in three uh, it's how it's happening now uh, i understand that uh, the industry of smartphones and this is an industry i don't know <laughs> behind uh, beside being a consumer <laughs> a user of it but in in the household uh, appliances um the the um, the way it's happening today. Uh, so your Whirlpool fridge uh, has a trouble, has an issue. You can go on the website. You have the section troubleshooting. Uh, you have the section self-repair. We have videos that explain for things what can be done. And then there is service. Uh, so the first step is really troubleshooting. We are not going replacement. This is the first step is troubleshooting. Second one is self-repair, when it can be self-repair. When there is electronic and more than interior property when there is safety at, at stake. Uh, we, 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 this needs to be done by, by service. Uh, uh, so if for self-repair, the, the second step, you can order online uh, spare parts on a Whirlpool website, but you know this is available on, on many things online and relatively accessible. And, and I think beside uh, the, the sustainable product initiative, we need to trust at some extent that there is competition. The EU is a single market. It's open to competition. And you know, sustainability uh, is a, a way for us as an industry to raise the bar and, and to, to because that's what consumers, people want. So um, uh, spare parts are widely available on, on website, uh, Whirlpool and not Whirlpool. Uh, and then service, uh, yes, you can have access uh, to, uh, depending on the countries, the places, to a, a, a Whirlpool uh, service or guaranteed service, or you can choose your, your, your service partner. And replacement come as, as a very last option, but really our commitment is to make sure that we can offer reparability, troubleshooting, self-repair, or service along the, the normal life cycle of, of the product. And it's not for tomorrow, it's for now. It's happening uh, 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 as we speak. Um, I, and, but I repeat, uh, uh, what is important in the circular economy is a reparability, but uh, let's do not forget as well the downstream and the upstream. Uh, so then uh, you can go in a question of a carbon tax, uh, su uh, uh, sustainable steel, sustainable plastic, uh, that are also critical uh, uh, for, 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 for to, in order to meet uh, the challenges we have by 2050. And this needs to be addressed now, and not by the industry alone, it needs to be done by collaboration. If we go to service, repairability, you enter to new business model. Uh, uh, our industry used to buy steel to produce beautiful appliances, 
uh, our future, the way we create value is beyond this in the future uh, by, uh, uh, by collaboration, by new partnership. So we can uh, be uh, an active partner on the circular economy. Thanks very much. Uh, Chloe, your organization uh, obviously touches exactly on this right to repair issue. Um, what do you think, uh, what are the sort of parameters that you're looking for? Uh, is, it, is it that people, and these are a couple of questions. We had Mike Parr and Mathieu Rama send us uh, some, some questions on exactly this, this issue. Um, should people be able to do it themselves? And how, how do you, I mean, we've heard from white goods, which just physically are an entirely different sort of thing than pulling, out a, pulling apart a smartphone mm. and fixing it. So uh, what, what do you want the commission to include in, the, in its initiative? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we're not saying that everyone should repair their stuff. I guess it really depends on the level of skills and confidence that you have. I'm a very clumsy person. I probably won't repair something that is very complicated. But we want people to be able to have that choice that when it comes down to it, if something breaks down, they can have the choice of whether they're going to repair it themselves, whether they're going to take it to a professional repairer, or whether they're going to take it to their local repair cafe. Because um, we, this is what we advocate for, a universal right to repair. And universal in the sense of all products covered, but also in the sense of who can repair these products. Um, and for some products, there is a there are clear anti-competitive practices that are happening today, including in the EU, when some manufacturers withdraw the access of spare parts, withdraw the access um, of repair manuals, and make repair extremely expensive via spare parts, notably. And this is not acceptable. And Gilles was mentioning, um, notably, spare parts. And I think that's a key aspect of it. And until spare parts are actually affordable, we won't have a universal right to repair. And this is because we've talked to some washing machine uh, repairers, for instance, or professional repairers. And what they have been telling us is that it all sounds great on paper, all these regulations. But if the spare parts still cost a certain number of euros, and this added with the cost of labor at the end of it, the whole repair cost, what, 50 euros less than buying a new washing machine, then people are going to choose to replace it. Um, and, and that kind of pushes repair down the hierarchy of waste and what we should be aiming for. Um, and your other question is in, yeah, what, what are we kind of expecting yeah. um, from the commission? So repair, um, cost, price, that is definitely a big, big topic. So I was really happy to hear the commissioner touch base on this. And then another issue is the issue of software. And as you have mentioned, this is a critical issue. Um, you know, the, the amount of years that software is supported, but also what we are seeing now today, which is extremely dangerous, is the use by some manufacturers of software as a barrier to repair. That it sort of locks the part yeah. in and that you can't, that exactly. you can't just sort of swap in other Exactly, parts. and that's called serialization or part pairing, and we're seeing very much an increase these practices, and this is extremely dangerous because what it could mean in the long term, if this keeps increasing, is that independent repair, and of course repair by end users, so people like you and I, could die. And it means that repair could only be potentially performed by authorized repairers, so people, repairers that are in the network of manufacturers. And this is extremely dangerous. And so this is also why I'm happy to hear um, that from the commissioner, you know, that the commission is looking into this because these, these are two extremely important topics. Otherwise, we're going to see more communication about right to repair, and it sounds great, but it's never going to be the universal right to repair that we need. And just to, to finish on this question, when you ask people whether they want right to repair for one product or another, you were talking about prioritization, they don't. They want to be able to repair their stuff or they want to be able to get their stuff repaired at an affordable price in an easy way. They don't want right to repair for their phone and not for their headphones or not for their washing machine. It doesn't work like this. They want it for all products. So until we kind of see that there's more efforts towards that, sure, maybe we'll have repairability requirements, but we certainly won't have the right to repair. Great. I'd like to shift a little bit to talk about uh, efforts to ban the destruction of unsold goods. France uh, is doing that. Virginia, so is this, is this, are you going to do the same thing? Are you going to look to, to put in some sort of a, an effort on that as well? Yes. So that is considered to be to be to be in scope. And uh, what are the what are the parameters? Is basically that if you've if you've if you're selling if you've got returned goods, you cannot destroy them. That's 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 the way to look. 
Yes. So of course, uh, first of all, we need to 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 to, to approach it through uh, you know through reusability angles as well. We need to make sure that the the, the goods we we produce that uh, the the uh, the the words and the, in the end of the day, uh, the cycle would keep on going and and we could use uh, spare parts uh, through through the processing in uh, producing new goods. So, but one of the, 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 the key things, of course, is to, to, to preventing it from, from uh, destroying. Uh, the, the, if, uh, if countries move ahead on their own, as France has done, is there a, is there a danger to uh, the single market? If you have, if you have differing rules in, in different jurisdictions about, uh, about how to tackle these, uh, these issues? We always have, you know, uh, d different speed at, at, at which pace, you know, member states move. And uh, we we now speaking about the, the very concrete legislation. But if you look overall at the circular economy, I think the potential that has to be picked up uh, is still unequal among the member states. And we have some member states who don't even have a yet a strategy for circular economy. Uh, but uh, I think our role here is ensuring a level playing field, is ensuring that uh, we are, that our legislation is clearly uh, chipping in for uh, our EU Green Deal goals and, and, and circular economy can play a very important role on um, uh, taking off pressure from environment, of ensuring that, that uh, uh, mineral and, and, and other uh, um, extraction and other resources extraction is is is, is not uh, destroying biodiversity is not driving climate change and most importantly I think it's also important for uh, our companies uh, it can uh, secure them it can uh, ensure that uh, we avoid uh, future shocks of um, supply chains uh, it ensures that uh, by uh, having a secondary raw materials market uh, that we uh, are less dependent on the third countries. So I think there is a uh, multiple benefits uh, and uh, we will always have a situation when there is someone more ambition, uh, ambitious than the other. Uh, commission will do its work to, to, to push member states to use the, uh, the, the funds available uh, to, to, to uh, channel them into uh, the Green Deal objectives and one of them and low hanging fruit, which is again, uh, a win-win to, to everyone. It's very like uh, by, by, by consumers. Business uh, approaches it also very open-mindedly. Uh, it's a circular economy. Thanks very much. Uh, Delara, what's, uh, what's your view of the position of the Environment Committee on this, uh, uh, this push to end, to end the destruction of unsold goods? Uh, we are very, very much in favor of it because um, I, I think, um, as you mentioned, France um, going forward in that direction, um, I think uh, it really is a clear sign that um, EU has to, to take up on this because um, this is something I think it's it's really hard to, to explain and something that's also not visible to the consumer himself. Um, maybe also already thinking that um, sending back an item which you probably thought or expected to be out um, you 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 could have just kept it by yourself. Uh, instead, you decide to send it back, and then it's uh, distracted. So th um, this is a co total waste of resources we are seeing there on a daily basis. And I think this is something uh, where we, especially if we want to to claim the European single market to be more sustainable, we have to act, and we also have to 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 make the rules. What I'm also looking forward, where I'm not um, seeing the, and maybe some some of the someone on the panel has. Uh, an idea on that is the question I ask myself, how can we also make sure that um, this stops the practices and how can we, um, how, how will we have to, uh, yeah, some, some kind of um, follow up on, on when there is a ban of uh, destruction being uh, imposed from a European level, how can we make sure that it is really implemented on the ground? So I think um, it's a crucial question, but we really have to look also to, to make it uh, implementable. Great, thanks very much. We are almost out of time, and so I'm going to end on a little quick round of questions on a more personal type of question. Uh, what is the most circular thing in your life? 
and I'll start with myself. My most circular thing is that I have a motorcycle, which I love dearly, which is from 1999. Runs fantastically. I have no intention of changing it. It's great. So, Virginius, maybe we could start with you. What's the most circular thing about you, about your life? First of all, I uh, do get attached to, to, to things, and I never, uh, you know, I don't like uh, Black Fridays and so on. I always uh, say that I've saved all my money during the Black Friday because I didn't buy anything. Uh, but I'm very happy with um, the app uh, called Winted, where you can uh, sell and, and, and buy uh, um, uh, secondhand clothing. Uh, which is, I think, a, 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 a very good innovation, which is now very well spread uh, across uh, across Europe. It's very much picked up by, by young people um, because the textiles is, is something that we haven't mentioned much today, uh, discussing, discussing electronics, but their uh, footprint, uh, environmental footprint, is huge, and we will definitely have to, 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 to fight it. Fantastic. Thank you. Delara. What's circular about I, your life? I um I I I really I really try to not buy too many new clothes. So what I really like about as we are now heading towards Christmas, I I have a Christmas skirt. I I always like to rewear. I think I have it for fifteen years now. And um, it's a it's a it's like an ugly Christmas sweater, but just a skirt. And, and I like to rewear it any time. And I think it's also. A, a, a circular thing I have, and I, I hope that I will be able to wear it for, for some years. Fantastic, thank you. Gilles? For me, it's not a sustainable good, it's a sustainable practice uh, that I pass a passion I, I pass to my kids about hiking. I got it from my parents. This is a very sustainable uh, 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 time to uh, way to to love the nature and doesn't consume much beside your own energy. And this, I'm passing my this passion to my kids and uh, hopefully at some stage to my grandchildren. Fantastic, Chloe. I'm circular in terms of circular. I'd say just like the commissioner buying second hands, um, whether it's clothes and vented or also electronics on platforms such as Black Market or Refurb, who are actually members of the campaign because we haven't really touched base on refurbishment today, but it's also a critical part of the solution. Um, and it's it's it will become hopefully the default budget option as well in the future for, for electronics. So yeah. Second hand, I'd say. Fantastic. Thank you very much uh, to all of the panelists uh, for what I thought was a really interesting discussion on what we will be a big part of what we're going to be writing about for sustainability uh, in the first months of, uh, of next year. Um, we have a poll. Let's see what the result of the poll was. Um, what would help Europe turn its economy circular by 2050? We have... 6%, let's see if we can get this little green thing, a robust and transparent methodology to monitor progress towards a circular economy. 50% said policies and thinking to shift waste orientation to resource orientation. 39% reform current waste policies and include alternative recycling methods like chemical recycling. And 6% again is attract investments in Europe to drive innovation for circular economy solutions. Um, and so thank you again to the panel. And our next panel discussion is Green Data Centers, Holding the Key to a Sustainable Future. And the moderator uh, is Laura Cayali, our technology correspondent at Politico. And please remain seated as the next session will begin in just a very few minutes. Thanks very much. <laughs>